Grey Goo is an RTS game in a similar style to the Command & Conquer series. It's even made by some of the original developers from Westwood, which made Command & Conquer back in the day. These developers fled the death grip of EA to form their own studio, Petroglyph. After Westwood was killed off like so many other EA bought studios, Petroglyph went on to make Star Wars Empire at War, which is a game I enjoyed quite a lot. So many years ago when I heard these guys were making a new sci-fi RTS, to say I was a little excited was an understatement. The first glimpses of the game looked like it was going to be pretty high quality, with fancy CGI trailers rivaling even those of Blizzard. But the first red flag should have been the name Grey Goo, which is the name of a potential disaster in which nanotech eats everything and self-replicates out of control wiping out all life. Though as a name for an epic sci-fi RTS is a bit meh. Science is sometimes terrible at naming stuff. I mean it's not exactly a name that invokes strong emotions. It's more like, oh, that's what you're calling it. Nobody's going to take you seriously if you yell out into a crowd, the Grey Goo is coming. Ooh. But the name is actually kind of on point when describing the game. It's not a bad game or a good one but somewhere in the grey area in between with a lot of lost potential. But before I get into that, let's talk about how it runs. It actually runs pretty well, I only had one crash through my entire playthrough, and options are pretty standard. There is a profanity filter option for some reason which is a little odd. Fuck off. The only thing that did bother me was the loading times for missions which sometimes felt like forever. So maybe stick it on an SSD to help with that if you do play it. They do try to hide this a little with cutscenes and briefings before missions. The cutscenes are high quality and all but watching them play out I never actually got invested in the story. It's like that Final Fantasy movie The Spirits Within from the early 2000s that had that big budget and some okay actors in it. The visual quality was up there but it didn't make me feel anything to watch it. Having high production values in something doesn't always equate to it being good. Especially if the story and gameplay don't back it up. To be fair, the in-game graphics are good for an RTS too, with fairly good animations and details in the models, but the units are missing a bit of character some good voice lines would provide. The ones that are there aren't bad or anything, they're just dull. Let's run them down, providing support. I mean a soldier's death scream from Tiberian Sun has more character than anything I heard in this game. <laughs> Music for the game fares better, I mean it had Frank Kaplaki who made freaking Hell's March making music for it, which is some of the best video game music ever. And if you disagree then explain it to this guy. Though while playing the game I never really got amped by the music, which is odd because listening to it without the game makes it more enjoyable. Lancer online. Recharging. Lancer ready. So somehow this game is so average it managed to make the music, which is good, feel average. Oof. I think a lot of what makes the game average is it was trying to do too much. You can tell it was trying to compete with Starcraft 2 with an epic story and going big on multiplayer, but from what I can tell the devs didn't quite have enough resources to pull off what they wanted, because obvious corners were cut. Like the story campaign, the length is average if you played one faction story in an older RTS, but instead of that, you get the three factions mini campaigns combined into one. And even though these mini campaigns are short, I felt like I'd seen all that the units could do for a faction way before their part of the story was done. Most of the units for each faction don't really feel unique. They kind of all blend together into bland versions of units you'd expect to be in this type of game. Like infantry, tank, siege units, etc. No unique attacks or effects really. The peons from Warcraft feel more unique than all these units combined. Mm -hmm. work, work. The units in the game aren't bad, they're just boring. The short length of each faction's part in the story contributes to this, as you don't get a chance to get invested in the story or the dull characters before moving on to the next. They tell a coherent story, but if I'm not caring when a main character dies, then you're probably doing something wrong. I mean most of the Command & Conquer games had super cheesy ridiculous stories, but I had fun watching them and the characters you know had, um, character. SPACE! Okay, but before I get too into the story, let's talk about gameplay. You start each mission by collecting resources called Catalyst and building up a base and an army to take objectives on a map. You'll also get side bonus objectives to do as well, but a lot of these are just there for the sake of being there. If you do them, they might make completing the mission a little easier, but most of them just make the mission longer for no real benefit. So most of those you can forget about if you can beat a mission without doing them. Each faction has a different base setup, with the betas and the human faction being fairly similar, and the grey goo being the most different. They all have a share problem, the basic line lineup of units is fairly small and a little too similar with each other's factions. They also rely on upgrades a bit too much to make the units start to feel unique. To better explain this I'll do a brief breakdown of each faction. Ok so the first faction you play as is the beta who have a pretty thick South African accent to sell their alien vibe. And sending everyone else north to the keep. All stockpiles of refined catalyst are being transported to the aperture. Which if you're from South Africa like I am doesn't really work on selling how alien they are. They just sound like someone from Durbanville. 
So the beta have the most traditional setup of units that you find in an RTS, which is fine since they are the first faction you play as. They take you through the basics of building up a base and turning out units. What I liked about them were the larger factories that allowed you to build multiple units at a time. Another thing I liked about the unit production for the beta is that you can set factories to auto build units. So you don't have to keep going through your multiple factories to keep turning out units individually. It would really suck if you had to do that. The lineup of units is pretty standard. Tank, anti-tank, infantry, etc. Upgrades you give to units and missions can give them a little uniqueness and allow them to be customized a little for that specific mission. Which is nice, but it makes the base units feel underwhelming. Some of these upgrades should have been on the units to begin with. Like for example the Stalker, it's a basic anti-tank unit without any upgrades, and that's all it does. But with an upgrade it becomes a stealth unit that's now good for hit and run attacks. This shouldn't be an upgrade, it should be a standard feature of the unit. Because of this the faction feels very generic. But there is one unique unit the beta have. An epic unit which is a floating factory artillery cannon that fires nukes. I'll admit it was fun to use and if the game had a bit more ridiculousness like this it probably would have been more enjoyable. Next up is the human faction which in the game appears very advanced technology wise. Like they teleport structures into existence and use advanced AIs to help run things. But most of the units don't reflect that. They basically perform on par with the beta and their units mostly have the same basic setup or are downgraded versions of the beta units. I mean at least they got one extra infantry unit whose job it is to basically tank damage for the other infantry unit. The trident excels at taking punishment, while the revolver's three turrets dish it out. That's something, I guess. They also have a lightly armored scout unit that needs an upgrade to get stealth. The beta version of this unit already has stealth without an upgrade. This probably shouldn't have been an upgrade as it feels like the unit is just a worse copy of the beta one, which makes it feel less unique. Like it could have been a short range teleporting scout or something. So the most technologically advanced faction doesn't really feel like it. There is a story reason why the humans are so downgraded tech wise even though they look advanced. Humans had a big bad war, decided to stop all wars and now they don't know how to make new weapons anymore blah blah blah. So they are basically pacifists forced to fight using AIs to do their dirty work. Also even though they are more advanced they can't build anywhere on the map like the beta. All their buildings need to be connected to a single core that you can't build any more of. With one exception if you get an upgrade for this one defensive structure. So in order to take resources you may need to spread power lines all over the map or just let your resource collectors mine far away from the resources. While this is an interesting idea it doesn't quite fit that a technologically advanced faction can't build somewhere because the extension cord can't reach there. This combined with how similar most of their units are to the beta kind of makes it feel like you're still playing as the beta just with restrictions added. They do have some things going for them like their teleporter tech which can let you put a limited amount of units anywhere in the map quickly. Also their epic unit the alpha is probably the most overpowered in the game with a laser beam that kills almost any unit in one shot and if you get too close to it it has an AOE attack. Oh and it can attack air units too. Good luck going against it later in the story because it's hard to take down even with a massive army. To stand a chance you'll need to keep moving your army out of the path of the beam while attacking it. That's a level of micro I don't think a lot of players have, including me. So if you have one of these you've probably just won by building it, if you know how to build it. The process of making most of the epic units in the game isn't exactly intuitive. They're kind of like Ikea furniture, you might need to look up a wiki on how to build some of them. Next faction is the Goo, which plays differently from the other factions in that they don't have base structures, just units. With Mother Goos being the closest thing to a base unit which sits on a resource to collect it, and spits out smaller Goos to make units out of. Sounds kind of cool right? Well it would be but there are some issues. First off you can't automatically make units like the other factions. You need to manually create each unit not once but twice. Because mother goos don't spit out ready made units but smaller goos. Which you then need to pick what units you want to make out of them. You can use the smaller goos to fight but they aren't as effective as the units they turn into. This feels like a bad design choice because you have a faction which in my opinion should be one that overwhelms the enemy with easy to produce massive numbers of units. But instead requires the most micromanaging of unit production in the game. You can get around this a little by group selecting all the mother goos together and setting a single rally point and then making a bunch of units in one go. But you still have the problem of selecting what units you want to make after that. There is another problem with the goo because they don't have defensive base structures at all. You're going to have to use a fair amount of your units to defend your mother goos at times, which eats into your unit cap which is the same size as other factions, who don't need to use as many units for defense. Like for example they have a unit called a bastion, which is literally a walking wall, which can't even attack unless it's upgraded and then it will only attack once it's in a critical state. You can use it in your army to soak up damage, but you'll mostly use it for defense. 
So a faction which should overwhelm its enemy with its ability to replicate in large numbers will tend to have a smaller attacking force than the other factions. These design choices, in my opinion, don't really gel well together. Like they should have given the Gu a larger unit cap or give them some defensive options which don't take away from their unit limit. Now you can get around these problems a bit if you play aggressively with the Gu, which is probably what the devs intended, but it's not always going to work considering there are missions where you kind of have to turtle up a bit. There are some things I liked about the Gu. In the Gu form they can go over high terrain, which can be useful sometimes. Also their epic unit the Purger is pretty powerful, though it takes forever to build even with feeding it Mother Goose to help finish it faster. It's the closest any unit in the faction comes to being unique, just like the other faction's epic units. Which I think highlights the fact that all the factions have the same problem, they feel underdeveloped. It's kind of like they're all the beta versions of what they should be. There may have been plans to make the factions deeper, but either they didn't have the time or the resources to do it. The problem they may have caused this was the attempt to have both multiplayer and a single player campaign in the game with the limited resources the developers had. Too many corners were cut and what is left is something falling far short of probably what was intended. If they had focused on just the multiplayer or the campaign, then the game probably would have been better. Though personally for me, I wish it was the single player campaign, because I really miss having fun RTS campaigns to go through with unique and interesting units like they used to be back at the height of the Command and Conquer days. But since we are talking about campaigns, let's go over the game story. The story starts with the beta who are running away from a scary unknown force called the Silent Ones. An enemy that wiped out their previous home, but in an attempt to escape through a wormhole, something comes through and attacks them, which they think might be the Silent Ones, but it turns out to be human drones, though the beta are not taking any chances and mobilize their forces to protect themselves. They maybe overreact a little. As the beta and the humans fight each other, another challenger enters the match, called the Goo. Turns out the Goo is made by humans long ago to explore space, but got bored with doing that, and decided, screw exploring, let's attack all the things. Which the beta think, okay, for real this time, this must be the Silent Ones. So far the story is kind of interesting, but the characters are a little flat and generic. But this is where the story starts to get predictable and a little boring. The beta and humans fight each other for a little, but find the power of friendship, and team up to take on the Goo together. Which is okay story-wise, but then they manage to beat the Goo by sacrificing an AI called Singleton, who I think you're supposed to grow attached to in the short human campaign, but all I thought about him was his name could be a kind of funny dating app name. The plot twist turns out to be that Singleton didn't die, and he somehow managed to merge with the goo, which gets explained in a DLC that probably didn't need to be made or played. Singleton finds out that the goo are actually trying to protect life in their own really destructive counter to logic way. From, wait for it, the actual big bad silent ones which are coming, but for real real this time. Promise it's not another predictable bad guy fake out. And the rest of the story is the goo beating everyone to near death to be friends with them, to get ready to take on the real bad guys. Which is a bonus end mission to finally fight the silent ones, but it's actually a giant probe that does AoE damage the whole mission. It's a pretty disappointing last mission that does super hard sequel baiting as well. If you want to actually see the silent ones called the Shroud, you can play them in a skirmish match. For being the silent ones, they do make a lot of angry dolphin sounds. The game had some potential if it was developed more, but I don't think it's going to get a sequel. And playing through it made me miss the Command and Conquer series, more than enjoying this game itself. Though you can have a little fun with it, the game tries too hard to go in too many directions with limited resources, which makes it fall flat in the end. But at least Petroglyph is still around, and are sort of going back to their roots, which is nice to see. It makes me a little hopeful for what the future brings from them. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, consider subscribing. See you next time. With Mother Boo's. Mother Boo's. <laughs> um.